Welcome you all um, to this lecture by Professor Geert Loving, uh, the title Program Sadness. Uh, Geert Loving is a Dutch media theorist, internet critic and author of an incredible series of books on internet and network critique from the very beginning of the current internet era, so the early 2000s. He wrote books like Uncanny Networks, Dark Fiber, My First Recession, Zero Comments, Networks Without a Cause, Social Media Abyss, Organization After Social Media, and Set by Design. But Gerd uh, was also one of those initiators of uh, internet cultures and early networks uh, since 1980s and 1990s. Uh, some of you might have heard about NetTime. In 2004, he founded the Institute of Natural Cultures at the Amsterdam University of Applied Science. And this institute organizes conferences, publications, and research networks such as Video Vortex, Unlikas, Critical Point of View, and Society of the Query, and Money Lab. So all these projects uh, have uh, involved both publications and uh, conferences. Recent projects deal with digital publishing and the future of art activism. And I will heartily invite you to visit the website of the Institute of Natural Cultures. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. You will coming up, coming up. Okay, you will show it later. Um, as most publica publications and monographies there are open access, as Kev and his group has over the years always been loyal to the internet open access principle. Today's lecture is titled Program Sadness and touches upon social, cognitive and emotional consequences of our daily use of social media platforms. Welcome everybody. Um, thanks so much for um, the invitation to Annalisa and uh, everyone here. Uh, for making it possible uh, for me to um, to be here and uh, to present my work and uh, hopefully also to work with you. Uh, I'm in this building on the fourth floor, uh, room, room 403, so if you want to uh, visit me, uh, please uh, come. Um, and so uh, I'm here this week, next week. Um, you can find my email address on the website if you want to uh, drop me a line and, and uh, uh, say, uh, you know, I want to present my work, discuss. Uh, there's many, many Italians that uh, come to work with us. At the moment, we have even two. One is uh, um, working more on the technical side. The other um, is a PhD student. Uh, so uh, the um, exchange uh, between the, uh, our Institute of Network Cultures and Italy uh, is uh, very close um, uh, from, uh, from the very beginning. So you're very welcome uh, also to spend time in Amsterdam with us or collaborate in one of the projects or if you need uh, supervision, uh, something with uh, we're very open uh, for that. Okay, uh, the website, um, uh, as you can see here, um, <clears throat> we started it um, 18 years ago when I returned from uh, Australia in the University of Melbourne, where I did my PhD, and then uh, University of Queensland, where I was a postdoc. Um, and um, yeah, this. Uh, Small institute, we are with three or four people, plus interns and, uh, uh, you know, some other people. Uh, we don't have students, but that's another story. Um, uh, we're based in an applied science school for vocational training, a media and communication faculty with 5,000 students, uh, an overall university of 50,000. So it's quite, uh, quite large. And we're a small uh, research center because research is supposed to be done at the universities. But um, in fact, uh, 25 years ago, the idea was introduced that uh, the polytechs, uh, the vocational training, uh, should also uh, start to have a research component. So um, uh, this is why um, um, 
you know, we exist as a, as a small research unit uh, inside uh, the applied science uh, uh, school. Okay. Um, for the, from the very beginning, uh, we, we built research networks around emerging topics. At the beginning, uh, it was uh, ICT for development, um, uh, Wikipedia, um, uh, the whole question of um, uh, the architecture of search engines. And then, of course, from uh, 2011 onwards, the, the, the kind of critique of the social media, because, yeah, unfortunately, I have to say the, the critique of the social media has been with us for a very long time, already more than a decade. Um, and uh, maybe this is also one of the reasons why, uh, you know, my new book is called Stuck on the Platform, uh, because maybe you've noticed the whole internet uh, is stuck. Uh, it's dominated by a very few um, uh, monopolies, uh, tech giants, and the medium as such has not uh, developed in the last uh, t 10 years. Of course, the uptake, many, many more people have started using it, uh, but that uh, did not result in more uh, innovation. The, the innovation of the internet itself came to a complete standstill. Um, so, um, <clears throat> okay, um, so the, the research uh, in that sense uh, changed a little bit maybe from, um, let's say, the potential of the use in social, cultural, um, you know, fields, more to the impact of the medium. So we see a, a change also in the name. For instance, 10, 20, particularly 20 years ago, we still spoke of new media. Now, nobody speaks of new media anymore, right? They are not new anymore. Uh, they are absolutely dominant. Uh, and we don't speak anymore about their potential or possible potential, right? Uh, right now, uh, we are kind of going in a shift from discussing what is possible to uh, understanding uh, the, the psychosocial impacts of um, systems that uh, are uh, not changing. And in a way, they're only changing uh, in the way, in the sophisticated way, for instance, they uh, surveil on us. They, uh, you know, are uh, getting better and better in data uh, extraction, artificial intelligence, etc. But that uh, has very little to do with our own, uh, you know, um, let's say desires or possibilities of what uh, the technology could uh, do. Okay. Uh, here you can see an overview uh, of uh, uh, the, 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 re the projects and the, the people that uh, have blogs with us. Um, and um, let me see. Uh, one of the more uh, recent ones, which started in fact in 2013 and is the most successful uh, network has about a thousand active members is uh, MoneyLab. And MoneyLab obviously is related to the whole, uh, uh, you know, emergence of uh, Bitcoin, blockchain, now NFTs in relation to the wider discussion about uh, the political economy and uh, what digital money is, uh, which is uh, uh, the discussions about cashless society, universal basic income, uh, experiments with uh, crowdfunding and so on, right? So it is a it is an an expanded definition of uh, of the possibilities of digital money. It is not just Web three or or crypto as it is called um, uh, today. So um, so this is the uh, this is the money lab. Uh, uh, product. It still has uh, uh, stuff like uh, you know mailing list and Discord. Um, 
We have hosted five big international uh, virtual conferences during COVID alone. So um, it's uh, that's it's quite a, quite a lot. Um, and um, you see some of the the recent uh, postings uh, on uh, on the blog. And even though we're quite, um, let's say, critical of the right wing populist uh, uh, dominant uh, rhetoric uh, in this uh, field, uh, we're also uh, ourselves very much, um, you know, involved uh, in this uh, in this question. So a lot of what we do um, uh, at the Institute of Network Cultures, you could call, let's say, uh, it's a radical critique from the insider perspective. So you know, we don't we don't try to take an outsider perspective. We are ourselves defining uh, us as technologists, as people who are involved in the further development, for instance, of protocol standards, discussion, discussions even about uh, user, uh, you know, um, usability, uh, things like that, right? Or the creation of, uh, of communities, uh, uh, user user cultures and so on and so on up to the level of course of uh, of pop culture I think of uh, you know the study of um, of memes for instance uh, so th so this is an example um, and then I come to the um, uh, the here you see the the three recent projects because um, in fact because we exist as uh, for so long, uh, we also also have now different generations of people who worked at the institute, right? And exactly in COVID, uh, the existing generation moved on to get better jobs, and um, so now I'm working with a lot of the the room is uh, on average uh, 26, 27 year old. So it, it's again very young uh, generation. And we're focusing at the moment on these, um, let's say, four topics. Our cre creative reset is uh, is about the, the debate about precarity in the arts. It's an old topic, but it's an urgent topic. And even in the COVID times, it became even more uh, urgent, right? So um, it's also about the question of, uh, you, you know, how can artists make a living? Uh, and in the digital age, this is becoming more and more uh, of a, a problem because uh, they're supposed to give their way uh, their work away for free. Um, but now, of course, you have uh, the whole question of uh, and the, the experiments with the NFTs, the so-called uh, you know non-fungible tokens. Well, so there is a big uh, a big debate uh, about that. So. Uh, then um, we we got research money from the Applied Science uh, uh, Fund in the Netherlands, and uh, this is a, this is this only started uh, two months ago. This is a two-year project, uh, and this is uh, related uh, to how uh, after COVID we want to redefine, let's say, how offline and online. Uh, work together. For instance, we are on Zoom now, I suppose, although, you know, I am not really aware at the moment that we are on Zoom. I know we are, eh? but how, how, how do we, uh, how do we do this? How can I become more aware uh, that they are here, right? Zoom is not providing me with the, with those tools I'm here to present. Uh, Zoom, in a way, is a very, very old-fashioned uh, broadcasting, narrowcasting uh, model uh, in, in which a presenter presents something. Uh, it's not. It has no, almost no uh, community aspect, except for, of course, the the chat function, uh, which in some cases in Zoom uh, is used very well. But we know that in the business environment, in work environment, and in education, 
Zoom is a, is a complete uh, disaster when it comes to interactivity, right? And interactivity, uh, you know, is our business, right? And why are we performing so badly uh, with this with this tool, right? And this is a question we need to we need to understand that uh, Zoom uh, teams and other tools are used by hundreds of millions of people, right? So it's not exactly um, a marginal question, um, but how can we, um, let's say, redefine uh, participation, debate, dialogue, right, in these in these environments? Uh, that that uh, if you look at uh, Zoom and Teams, are primarily focused only on the, on the presenter hmm? and are not really, uh, let's say, collaborative tools. Yeah? And this is, I think, also what education uh, really needs. We need more uh, collaborative uh, tools. We can even say we need more tools uh, for decision making, for instance. Uh, Zoom is a very, very bad, extremely poor uh, when it comes to, uh, have you tried to make, a, you know, come to decision making process? You know, it's very, very difficult, right? So, um, so even there, um, it is, um, uh, it's important, um, at least, you know, I'm very happy we're kind of not really post COVID, but almost as I look here, some of you are still wearing masks, others uh, don't, which is, uh, I think a good, um, uh, way to describe that we are in a period still of uh, transition. Uh, at least uh, I can see uh, people here in front of me, which uh, is extremely uh, pleasant. Um, at, for two years, we were not able uh, to really uh, see each other and, uh, and look around, right? Looking around uh, on, on Zoom is extremely difficult, right? Especially when you're talking yourself, you have to somehow get an idea, but then do you really sense what what their faces are expressing, not really, right? So, um, so there's uh, a lot of work to be done. Uh, this, uh, this is in particular this uh, research project uh, of two years is, is together with cultural institutions and think uh, especially, uh, you know, in theater, uh, also in Italy, theater, uh, but even the concert halls, they have started doing some some experiments, right? which is, is very good. Uh, and we need to learn from the experiences that uh, that uh, have been made, particularly in the um, uh, in the cultural sector, because academia has performed very, very badly uh, uh, and has not further developed uh, the tools. Uh, funny enough, uh, academia had very, very, very different uh, uh, problems to resolve during COVID. Right? It was not busy, let's say, innovating its own tools, but in my opinion, it should, right? So now that we leave COVID, this is very, very important uh, and that we all start to open the discussion how online and offline should be renegotiated, should be brought together. Um, in, my, um, in my new book, which I present tomorrow, there's a chapter, um, this is the book, um, and um, so um, in this book, uh, I have a chapter um, on uh, the autonomy of Zoom fatigue, um, and uh, I'm working in, in that uh, um, capacity uh, closely together with uh, Donatella Della Ratta from Rome, uh, who works at John Cabot University. And she wrote, uh, let's say, a parallel uh, essay. Um, I was more focusing on the Zoom fatigue, and she was more focusing on what she calls teaching in the void. Maybe you remember teaching in the void, right? Um, very, very difficult for two years. Uh, the, the teachers have been unable to convince uh, the students to turn on their cameras, right? 
um, and uh, for, for the right or wrong reasons, it doesn't matter, right? Uh, but uh, so Donatella uh, describes in this essay uh, the, the, the perspectives from, from both sides, from the sp sides of the teacher and of, from the side of, uh, of the students. Right? And these are the topics that will be, will, and that, that's what I'm trying to say here, these are topics that will stay with us Right, um, we have been massively uh, against our will been introduced to the world's most poorest softwares uh, when it comes to online education, right? We cannot go back to Zoom and Teams anymore, right? We should demand more and, and we should really uh, start to think, you know, what, uh, what is the future uh, of uh, online education? For instance, in this setting, you know, it's unique. And in the past, this would have made headlines because there is a group here uh, in Italy together with a group in India, and we are both, uh, you know, um, participating in the same seminar. That in itself is a revolution, right? I mean, let's, let, it's very, very difficult, uh, but, uh, how can we uh, how can we further revolutionize uh, this this idea that you know there there is another group here right in a very very different part of the world huh? uh, where so the idea of uh, let's say intercultural global uh, dialogue especially in education has unique unique opportunities right and we are not really uh, uh, using them. Uh, I would say we are not even using one percent uh, of uh, of the possibilities, right? And so, um, so that's I, I would say what um, what is uh, what's ahead. Um, I want to um, yeah close uh, this. Uh, but by looking at one more thing which is dear to me and that's uh, a project um, uh, we started a couple, a couple of years ago already uh, in 18 I wrote a couple of um, uh, theoretical essays on this question of uh, meme theory what are memes uh, memes uh, are somehow marginal somehow funny uh, but uh, they're not really properly uh, studied. Now, there's one topic that is even more marginal than memes, that's emojis. Uh, there's very, very few uh, people uh, worldwide studying emojis. What they both have in common is that they are used by literally billions of users, right? So, so billions of users are using memes and emojis, but the study of it eh, uh, is next to zero, right? You have quite established, especially here in Bologna, you have art history uh, research centers, you have uh, a cinema school, right? Uh, there's a lot of knowledge about theater, you name it, eh, but the medium used by the billions, eh, they do not even have one researcher. And I'm now I'm talking about worldwide. Yeah, it's it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal, uh, and this is in general happening uh, to a lot of aspects of internet culture, right? The the further the internet grows, and this is the paradox that I'm dealing with in my book, the less we see it is studied, yeah? because the, there's no more newness. Uh, why would you bother, uh, right? Uh, it's banal, uh, it is uh, popular culture, but but in the wrong in the wrong way because internet is obviously you know a huge cultural and uh, psychological and uh, social problem, right? So so the, the internet is generating problems. Hmm? Uh, so it is it is kind of more something for the police, for lawyers, for uh, for people, for regulators, but it's not 
something uh, that we want to study, that we see uh, of as a part of cultural uh, production or or even popular culture, right? So that's this is uh, this is strange. Obviously, there are no internet departments in Italy. Um, uh, of course, you cannot study uh, internet in Italy. Funny enough, uh, the most internet theorists and uh, researchers in Europe are from Italy, right? Now, uh, why why is Italy producing the best theorists? Yeah, but is is completely lacking to translate this uh, in an institutional uh, setup, in an institutional environment. Uh, um, but again, um, no surprise, we need to, uh, uh, to understand that from the uh, paradox that I, uh, I mentioned, right? And so it means that internet uh, researchers in Italy in the future will have even less possibilities, right? This is and this is something uh, yeah that we need to uh, understand um, uh, and also maybe be realistic about and maybe also uh, you know be realistic demand the impossible we we should uh, try to um, uh, at least uh, understand where we are uh, in order to make. Uh, new demands and uh, to redesign, for instance, education, uh, the, the design of the, of the departments, but also education, of course, in primary schools and uh, high schools, because we are talking about something, you know, digital uh, education that, in fact, uh, needs to be a much, much larger uh, undertaken. Uh, if we want to have more responsible uh, users, you know, this should start uh, already in primary school, right? Not even high school. I mean, um, you know, already, as you know, uh, babies by the age of, of two, two, yeah, by, by the age of two, many, many babies already have quite an expansive uh, ex experience with mobile phones, tablets, uh, looking, uh, you know, at um, uh, some form of YouTube or online video. So, um, so uh, yeah, the, uh, probably primary school is already, you know, a bit late. But okay, so th this is the impact uh, of the of this uh, phenomenal media, and um, uh, yeah, how to deal with uh, the the paradox is is the question. Uh, is the question here. Um, so, um, yeah, we produced a number of uh, publications. Uh, I can only tell you it's extremely difficult to finance um, meme research because uh, really nobody is taking it serious. People think you're joking, huh? uh, which, you know, we, we literally do. <laughs> um, because yeah, what is it? Is it satire? Is it some kind of, um, uh, you know, background comment? Um, uh, why are, are memes, uh, you know, using always the same images? Uh, why are they so archetypical? Why, um, why, why are they based on images to start with? How is the relation today, especially for young people, between words and images? Right, we know that visual culture has grown and grown and grown, and now we are surprised to see that intellectual culture uh, is also, um, you know, dominated by visual languages, and the meme is only um, uh, an expression of uh, of the arrival uh, of this. Okay, uh, I'll, um, I'll probably stop. Here with uh, the presentation of the of the current uh, projects. Again, you can join them. You can uh, you know um, write to us. Please visit us when you're in Amsterdam. Uh, come and uh, see us. Uh, we're very open uh, to okay. that. Yeah. Are you ready to present? Yeah. Okay. So I am. Where? The first one. Good. Uh, the green one. No, the other one. The other one. Okay. Yeah, just run it. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> 
You give me start or go? Yeah. Go. go. Yeah. No. Uh, doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Okay, so now um, I'm coming to the topic. Um, is it changing? I think so. Let's try it. Otherwise, I will switch it. Or maybe. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Okay, good. Can you take that away? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, So I'm going to uh, read uh, some of the stuff I have been working on uh, over the past couple of years about programmed sadness. Um, I want to say here first before I start that uh, sadness is only one uh, of many affects of many forms of um, of emotions that uh, are triggered that are produced um, in today's society and uh, in um, in the online world uh, in particular. Um, just see it as a case study. Uh, I'm not in favor of sadness. I'm not sad myself. Although, you know, m many people ask, are, are you sad? You know, uh, that, that's not um, the, the point uh, so much. Um, of course, I noticed that uh, there's not so much um, writing about it, um, but it was uh, in the last couple of years, even before uh, COVID, very clear that um, the sadness um, that we see online is a kind of a mild form uh, of, and a temporary form uh, of depression, right? So, um, but depression uh, often, uh, you know, of course, if you look it up, you'll see that uh, depression uh, is a medical term. Uh, it's a medical condition. Hmm? Uh, it has a description and, uh, you know, uh, therapy and so on and so on, right? So, um, the uh, sadness, however, uh, is not a uh, and a sickness, it's not an illness, right? Um, so um, the, the sadness is a, is a mild stage uh, form of, um, it's, it's a form of reflection, let's say. Hmm? And this is how I see it. So in my definition, the, the sadness is the possibility of a reflection, so it it is a it's a moment um, in which uh, we start to think. The techno sadness, the programmed sadness, on the other hand, um, is a moment that because it is programmed immediately interrupts itself. So it is unlike the, let's say, the, the 19, 18th, 19th century definition of uh, melancholia. Uh, melancholia is a, is, a, is a long, prolonged state of sadness. Um, the programmed sadness uh, is something that uh, you know can happen for five seconds, hmm? usually not not much longer. Um, and, and this is of course due to the fact that um, uh, these environments um, 
are accelerated in an incredible way, right? So the acceleration defines the the temporality uh, of uh, of the of the of the feelings that we have, and the, so even anger uh, or other states, you know. Um, I have a colleague uh, inside the, the Institute of Network Cultures, uh, Maisha, and she is studying um, boredom. So she's studying the many, many aspects of boredom. And of course, boredom is, is quite close to sadness, no? but it, it's even probably m more indifferent, right? So, um, and uh, so boredom, um, I, I find also uh, very, uh, very interesting, but boredom probably uh, has more of a future. So the, the future really uh, is, is a future in which we want to be bored, right? We, we're longing to be bored and, and that's, that's wonderful. Uh, maybe uh, you have written, have read definition of boredom, which say you know that creativity can only be born uh, out of out of boredom, right? Because uh, that's a moment when when you're quite empty, and then new configurations in your head uh, start to happen. And so uh, this this is. Um, um, you know, the, this possibility uh, of boredom, um, this, uh, yeah, maybe even a revolutionary potential uh, lacks, of course, in the, um, in, in the, in the moment of sadness. Um, okay, um, I'll leave it here uh, and um, I will now um, go to the text and then uh, maybe I will stop every now and then maybe to explain some things or go further uh, into it. Let's dive into social media wariness, the cause of our, of our tired eyes. What are the techniques of resignation? that we are exposed to. The blissful ignorance after browsing an entire ecosystem of narratives is not surprising. Culture is a pendulum and the pendulum is swaying. The organized optimism hard coded in online advertisements and other forms of algorithmic advice turned out to be merely producing anxiety. As Caroline Coles Richard stated, what can't be cured must be endured. The suffering, sorrow and misery is getting tagged and filtered by our own self-censorship. We've been captured and feel frozen. What we receive is the anger and anxiety of the online other. The growing imbalance in the distribution of digital enchantment is neither causing a revolution or revolt, nor does it fade out. During the 2021 uh, lockdown misere, we've literally been stuck on the platform. What happens when your home office starts to feel like a call center and you are too tired to call to close down Facebook? How to get rid of your phone? Wrong answers only. We wanted to move on and used the pandemic as a reset, but failed. The comfort of the same old proved too strong. Instead of a radical techno imagination that is focused on the rollout of alternatives, we got distracted 
by fake news, cancel culture, and cyber warfare. Condemned to doom scrolling, we suffer from an oversaturation of cringe memes, conspiracy theories, and a never ending barrage of COVID factoids and stats, including conflicting interpretations and senseless comments. Random is fun. In my chronicles that I'm presenting here, we're staying with the trouble called internet and continue to dig deeper in the current stagnation phase while also asking how to unstuck and de-platform the platforms. As you and I are un, uh, not able to resolve platform dependency, we remain glued to the same old channels, furious at others about our own inability to change. So uh, my work starts with the confession, much like step one in the Anonymous Alcoholics 12 steps. And I quote here, maybe you know, uh, step one from AA. We admitted we were powerless, that our lives had become unmanageable. Once we're locked in, the path to infinity has been blocked. Instead, we're caught in a Truman Show-like repetition of the perpetual now, toiling around in the micro mess of online others that try to do their best, masking their failures and despair like everyone else. So your um, Bologna resident that I admire and work with, Franco Berardi, observes the, mom, the mental state of today's students. And I quote him here. I see them from my window, lonely, watching their screens of their smartphones, nervously rushing to classes, sadly going back to their expensive rooms that their families are renting for them. I feel their gloom. I feel the aggressiveness latent in their depression. End of quote. In the social media era, the Oblomov position is not an option. In particular, for those that cannot economically afford to get stuck in the abyss. The design is elegantly forcing to engage, make choices, click, agree and respond. If only we were able to take, uh, take action and make decisions. We experience the sadness of online existentialism minus the absurdity. If only Robert Faller's term interpassivity was ever really implemented in code instead of being yet another Austrian idea. We would indulge in a permanent state of indolent apathy. Instead, there is nothing passive about human machine interactions. And that's the problem here. Uh, the design of the, of, the, uh, of the systems is such that uh, we are forced to permanently interact. Uh, if only uh, the internet was uh, television, right? If only everything uh, was like YouTube or, or Netflix. This is not the case. Um, uh, everywhere we need to click, like, uh, uh, respond, retweet uh, uh, constantly. And if, if we are, um, you know, not paying attention, the system will not notice and, uh, uh, you know, will either 
lock you off or do something, uh, you, you will have to respond. The whole system uh, is designed in such a way uh, that you are uh, constantly uh, involved. We, the streaming egos, scribe, swipe, scroll, and are obsessed with self-creation. Facebook, the, so the sociological constant of our time, equals the unbearable lightness of nothing. Surrounded by this massive bubble of light matter, we literally see no alternative options, no multiverses for you. Jailed in the digital monad, you are free to dream about as many worlds as you like. Being on social, the Zen status of detachment is an ontological impossibility. And we can therefore never truly enjoy the secretive voyeur status. Interaction is our tragic existence. Instead, we're constantly asked to upgrade, fill in forms and rank our taxi drivers. What are the techniques of resignation that we are exposed to? Distraction equals exhaustion. You're engaged, enraged, but still retreat in your safe rabbit hole. When you're feeling tired and nothing seems helpful, you've reached the end of the downward spiral. You ignore the signs and will pay dearly, but for now, nothing matters much. What happens when your social graph falls flat and you have nothing to talk about? You forget to like and follow and no longer respond to text. The networks around you collapse, but you feel incapable to act. Is this the, the, the joy of missing out? And we tend to speak only about the fear of missing out. But is there something like a joy of missing out? The epic shit of others no longer impresses. The, perfect, the perfectionism has killed you, and now you are face to face with an empty bucket list. Ducking tired, bored with Reddit, Facebook, Insta, and nowhere else to go, it's damn sure you've lost interest in everything you were once passionate about. In his 10 arguments for deleting your social media accounts right now. VR uh, guru Jaron Lanier asks, and I quote, why do so many favorite tweets end with the word sad? He associates the word with a lack of real connection. Why must people accept manipulation by a third party as the price of a connection? According to Lanier, sadness appears in response to unreasonable standards for beauty or social status or vulnerability to trolls. Google and Facebook know how to utilize negative emotions more readily, leading to the new system-wide goal. Find personal ways to make you feel bad. There's no single way to make everyone unhappy. Compared to others, your ranking is low, and this makes you sad. Even technological sadness is a style, but a cold one. The sorrow, no matter how short, is real. This is what happens 
when we can no longer distinguish between telephone and society. Right? This is one of my, you know, with core theses, telephone and society, you know, we can no longer uh, distinguish between the two. And this is what makes it so hard also to study it. Hmm? If we can't freely change our profile and feel too weak to delete the app, we're condemned to feverishly check for updates during a brief in-between moment of our busy life. In a split second, the real-time machine has teleported us out of our current situation and on to the a level playing field filled with mini reports we quickly have to investigate. Omnipresent social media spaces claim, make a claim of our elapsed time, our fractured lives. We're all sad in our very own way. As there are no lulls or quiet moments anymore, the result is fatigue, depletion, and loss of energy. We're obsessed with waiting. How long have you been forgotten by your loved ones? Time, meticulously measured on every app, tells us right to your face. Kronos hurts. Should I post something to attract the attention of the other and show I'm still here? Nobody likes me anymore. As the random messages keep relentlessly piling in, there's no way to hold them, to take a moment and think it all through. Delacroix once declared that every day which is not noted is like a day that does not exist. Diary writing used to fulfill that task. Elements of early blog culture try to update the diary form for the online realm, but that moment has now passed. Unlike the blog entries of the Web 2.0 era, social media have surpassed the summary state of the diary in a desperate attempt to keep up with the real time regime. Instagram stories, for instance, bring back the nostalgia of an unfolding chain of events and then disappear at the end of the day. Like a revenge act, as a satire of an ancient sentiment gone by. Storage will make the pain permanent. Better forget about it and move on. Uh, so this is also the main explanation why uh, we cannot really store or memorize the social media, right? They're designed to be forgotten. Uh, so, so try to imagine what, what you saw on Twitter yesterday. This is impossible, impossible to even start to reconstruct even for us who have a very good memory, uh, this is this is next to impossible. Uh, try to tell somebody, uh, you know, um, uh, in five minutes after you close down, uh, let's say TikTok, what what you saw, right? And this is uh, impossible, impossible to uh, to summarize. So it's a kind of a sphere of the subliminal or, um, you know, Franco Berardi's new book is called The Third, the Third uh, Unconscious. And I'm, I'm kind of working in a direction to give that also a bit more shape. For me, this is a, a techno-social unconscious, right? So, um, uh, and the, the, the best explanation for that is that it's impossible for us to, to summarize uh, what we've experienced. And films, for instance, they have been designed for us to memorize the narrative. 
right? And, and endless studies have been done uh, how we can memorize characters, what they say, and um, yeah. Uh, for social media, it, it's the complete opposite. Yeah. So they've been designed to be forgotten. In the online context, sadness appears as a short moment of indecisiveness, a flash that opens up the possibility of a reflection. The frequently used sad label is a vehicle, a strange attractor to, en to enter the liquid mass called social media. Sadness is a container, right? So uh, with that, I mean everything can be sad. Everything you look at uh, is has a sad element. Uh, so um, it doesn't really matter uh, if you look at the a love scene or uh, the report from uh, Ukraine or, uh, you know, uh, an, an elephant in the zoo, uh, all these elements are potentially sad. Uh, so, so sadness is a container. Each and every situation can potentially be qualified as sad. Um, and I learned this from my son. Uh, he was a teenager at the time uh, and I started noticing that he called everything, you know, let's say there would be uh, food on the dinner uh, at the table and the food would be sad. And I looked at the food and I couldn't see the sadness in the food. Huh? I could not see it, huh? Huh? but it was there. It was very obvious. Huh? Huh? Um, yeah, so everything can be sad, right? Um, and through this mild suffering of the world, we enter the blues of being in the world, right? I don't want to be a Heideggerian, but okay, just look it up um, if you like. Right? Um, when something is sad, things around it become gray. You trust the machine because you, you feel you're in control of it. You want to go from zero to hero. But then your propped up ego implodes and the failure of self-esteem becomes apparent again. The price of self-control in an age of instant gratification is high. We long to revolt against the restless zombie inside us, but we don't know how. Our psychic armor is thin and eroded from within, open to behavioral modifications. And this is what uh, Facebook and all the others have studied very, very carefully using their uh, tremendous uh, big data uh, archives of our uh, online behavior to find out those subliminal behavioral modifications uh, they can make, right? And there's a whole school uh, of, um, uh, let's say, whistleblowers, uh, people who left the Silicon Valley companies and all of them, uh, you know, tell puzzles of the story uh, how this behavioral modification uh, is made uh, without us noticing yeah uh, so th it's it's quite um, it's quite subtle uh, everything is subtle and this is also why the the whole idea of fake news and propaganda uh, you know it is not really part of this and it can be uh, deconstructed and noticed fairly easy, much, much easier than um, uh, these very, very uh, subtle um, uh, manipulations of our, of our mental state. And uh, this is why, you know, it is so difficult um, to, um, let's say, 
pinpoint, uh, let's say, a political uh, ideology to someone like Mark Zuckerberg, uh, which, you know, people try because they say he's a right wing uh, populist close to Peter Thiel, who's on the, on the board of Facebook, while others say, no, 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 he is a, he's a Democrat, he is very closely tied to the Obama and Clinton administrations, and, uh, you know, and now Biden, of course. Uh, so, um, so, such a, a political, um, sub, let's say, subscriptions, um, um, they often um, uh, miss the point of uh, of the of the project uh, that is uh, uh, that is happening there. We should be careful to distinguish sadness from anomalies such as suicide, depression, and burnout. Everything and everyone can be called sad, but not everybody is depressed. Much like boredom, sadness is not a medical condition, even though never say never, because everything can be turned into one. No matter how brief and mild, sadness is the default mental state of the online billions. Its original intensity gets dissipated, seeps out, becomes a general atmosphere, a chronic background condition. Officially, um, for a brief moment, we feel the loss. A sea rage thing emerges, right? And so this, these uh, sudden ruptures of online rage is, uh, is another, uh, you know, very important um, uh, element that we could uh, that we could study. After checking for the tenth time what somebody said on Instagram, the pain of the social makes us feel miserable, and we put the phone away. Am I suffering from the phantom vibration syndrome? Wouldn't it be nice if we were offline? Why is life so tragic? He blocked me. At night, you read through the thread again. Do we need to quit again to go cold turkey again? Others are supposed to move us, to arouse us, and yet we don't feel anything anymore. The heart is frozen. Let's compare fleeting sadness in its technical form with the ancient state of melancholy. The melancholic personality seems to suffer from a disease. Unable to act, she withdraws from the world, contemplating death and other transient phenomena. While some read this condition, as depression and boredom, others reframe it as lazy passivity, as a creative strategy waiting for inspiration to strike. Instead of a fascinating derive into a vast arsenal of literary sources, I propose here a digital hermeneutics that shortcuts philology with the internal presence of the digital that surrounds us. Melancholy, often described as sadness without a cause, has a strong existential con connotation. While paying tribute to certain Kierkegaard, who uh, liberated melancholia once and for all of its medical stigma, describing it as the deepest foundation of the human in a godless society. The problem here is not a vertical one of going deeper. And so we are not going deeper, but a horizontal one. And for sadness, this is quite important. Sadness happens on the surface. 
on the surface of the interface, right? And this is why it's so difficult to look for deeper feelings, more meaningful, let's say, layers. And this kind of uh, maybe even classic psychoanalytic approach goes nowhere in the in the in the arena of the social media, right? For the social media, we need to remain on the surface. And that's very difficult, even for academics. You know, it's very difficult uh, because we try to find a deeper meaning. Hmm? But what happens when there is no deeper meaning and when the exploitation of the data uh, is exactly meant for us to stay on, on that, on that, well, how we call it, uh, a, a field, um, some call it a desert. Uh, it's something that is uh, definitely flat uh, and keeps us, um, um, keeps us flat also in our uh, um, mental state of mind. Melancholy is a thing of the past because there is simply no time anymore to indulge in a wistful state. One could, of course, defend the techno sadness uh, still bears the possibility of melancholia, right? So there is a possibility, but there's no time to really um, explain it. The implosion of the factor time has all but sabotaged the possibility to seriously drift off. Real-time machines constantly draw us back online, capture our attention, and do not allow extensive mourning. Strangely, melancholia requires concentration and focus. And this is a bit of a paradox huh? that maybe in the 19th century people would not have noticed. Hmm? Distraction, on the other, is all over the place and sadness is microdosed. The metric to measure today's symptoms would be time and attention, as it is called in the industry, right? So it, we are living in the age of the attention economy, right? And everything I pre present here uh, has to be understood within that context. While for the archaic melancholic, the past never passes, Techno sadness is caught in the perpetual now, sort of hand, hand of day. The primary identification is here in our hand, the phone. Everything is evident on the screen, right in your face. While confronted with the rich historical sources that dealt with melancholia, the contrast with our present condition becomes immediately apparent. Whereas melancholia in the past was defined by the separation from others, reduced contacts and reflection onto oneself. Today's tristesse plays itself out amidst busy social media. Uh, in Sherry Turkle's phrase, we are alone together as part of the crowd, a form of loneliness that is particularly cruel, frantic and tiring. And this is the big difference also when you read uh, how Hannah Arendt de describes uh, loneliness as uh, one of the foundational mental states which, uh, uh, you know, authoritarian rule wants to uh, apply. Uh, on its uh, on its subjects, right? The subjects need to be taken out of the social and into isolation, into loneliness. Uh, however, in the age of social media, this loneliness needs to be redefined because you are always lonely with others because of others, right? So the social uh, has never been as intimately 
experienced as as it is now in comparison uh, even you know and you in Italy you you, you know exactly what I'm talking about um, the fit the village the, the the family the tribe yeah they were all uh, social systems that were very very closely tied that would uh, were experienced by its uh, uh, members as as both very rich in the social way, but also incredibly uh, confining. Yeah? Um, th th but this new confinement, the digital confinement, uh, uh, has to be uh, described anew by us, right? This is our task. So what is loneliness in the age of social media? Uh, so this, for me, is still, you know, a challenge. Um, what we see today are systems that constantly disrupt the timeless aspect of melancholy. There's no time for contemplation or Weltschmerz. Social reality does not allow us to retreat. Even in our deepest state of solitude, we're surrounded by online others that babble on and on, demanding our attention. But distraction does not just take us away from the world. No, that, that uh, and this is another really difficult problem for us. Distraction does not take us away from the world. No, uh, the, this, it does not pull us away. Instead, it draws us back into the social. Uh, so distraction brings us into the social and this is this is a very difficult new well, it sounds like a paradox we cannot really uh, understand so distraction takes us into the social right and this, that's what you see when you walk out of, to the streets here you see the students they pass by and they are distracted and look on their phones right but this is uh, this is an, the normal uh, social uh, behavior right now. Social reality, as I call it, is the magic realm where we belong. That's where the tribes gather, and that's the place to be on top of the world. Uh, social relations in real life have, have lost their supremacy. The idea of going back to the village mentality of the place formerly known as real life is daunting indeed. How can uh, we redesign the social? Uh, now I come to a close. In such a way that it becomes impossible, even unthinkable for trolls and bots to permanently distract our thinking and behavior. We cannot spend uh, all the time and energy to reinvent the social without taking freedom into account, right? So we need to uh, be on the side of freedom. We cannot just, and this is the problem of, of all the regulatory systems right now, right? The, the regulatory uh, systems can only, um, re uh, can only define these systems as uh, if we take away the freedom, you know, people will be, will be, will function better in society, right? Not the liberty, huh? as I, um, uh, um, let's say, uh, the, the right-wing libertarians uh, speak about. No, I'm talking about freedom as defined by Hannah Arendt and also Isaac Berlin, um, that which is not just freedom from addictive and manipulative software. Can we rethink, for instance, um, uh, bots and algorithms or even artificial intelligence in such a way that they become pets again, jo toy, toys, tools, tools that work for us, not against us, and not behind our backs, but with us, instead of invisible oppressive systems that try to deceive and educate us. Technological freedom means the ability 
to uh, put them aside, to turn them off. We long for tools that assist us instead of colonizing our inner life behind our back. Our sadness will not be overcome with anger. Okay, I'll leave it here and want to open up for discussion. Did we stop the slides for? Oh, yeah, no, no. Did we switch to the other one? Yes, I did. Yeah, okay. No, then, then we we'll just leave it on. So we have uh, time for questions or questions? Yeah, both many times. All the time in the world. So maybe uh, if there are online comments, uh, just yeah. would you mind if I open the chat? Ah, yeah, 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 of course. Uh, maybe you can also read that. Okay, thank you so much, Kirt, uh, for um, this inspiring, um, let's say, uh, I see that as, as a rush or, or a run into uh, a lot of topics uh, that uh, span uh, into many disciplines. Um, <coughs> one comment or question? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, my name is Antonella Tarashe. I am a postdoc here at the Philosophy of Communication of Sanctuary Market. And uh, also, I would like to thank you for your rich and inspiring presentation. Um, that generated uh, some questions, not because I have uh, particular criticism, but just for raising some kind of discussion uh, about uh, something that interests me, especially the role of emotion in the use of uh, uh, social media and social network. And you talk very often of sadness, so very mm -hmm. prominent emotion, yep. and that feeling of loneliness. Mm -hmm. And I understand very much the talk about loneliness because in the end, we talk a lot with others through Zooms or other channels or social media, but we are physically alone mm -hmm. when we do this kind of things. What I understand a bit less, and maybe you, like, you may uh, specify more, is why you choose just one emotion, sadness, mm -hmm. to emphasize it so much to describe the condition of, your, of contemporary human beings with social media and social network. Because as I see, at least from my impression or uh, view of uh, this kind of phenomenon, there are a lot of emotions. Sometimes we can discuss about how much they are directed. Rage, polarization, like, also like love and compassion for new phenomena, new migrants or uh, news. And why just sadness? Why sadness is such a central role for you instead of putting sadness aside of many other emotions that could also be directed or uh, part of this bigger mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's a very, uh, very good question. Um, there's no uh, intellectual or theoretical um, explanation uh, for this. Uh, as I said, um, you know, I have some colleagues who uh, study, uh, for instance, boredom. Um, I have myself started to, to investigate, uh, for instance, loneliness. Um, so I am aware of, of other, uh, you know, states of mind for sure. Um, maybe the choice um, particularly came from my own my own, uh, let's say, love for the uh, form of the essay and the uh, investigation uh, into 
one specific uh, mode of, of being. Um, so I understand uh, the limitation of, uh, of, the, um, of the case study. Hmm? Uh, and I have always presented it, uh, you know, in the in the wider range. However, uh, there is probably another reason uh, because I, I noticed that there was a lot of references to the sadness, but not much uh, theorization of it. Also, I noticed because, you know, I'm a male myself. I noticed that, of course, uh, the, the, the most urgent topic uh, in my field is male anger, huh? right? Uh, so male anger is uh, studied widely, hmm? um, it, uh, right? And most of the, the topics that you encounter when it comes to online regulation, in fact, uh, it goes back to, uh, you know, um, male anger, uh, rage uh, leading up to sexual harassment or whatever or racism or uh, yeah then there are all sorts of uh, 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 let's say uh, political and so social uh, expressions of that um, of of trolling or yeah primarily done uh, by males mm -hmm. uh, so that field um, is widely covered, huh? um, but I also note, yeah, I, uh, I noticed that the more, uh, let's say, uh, sad or melancholic aspects of it uh, were not so covered, but um, the Silicon, Silicon Valley has an equal interest uh, in it. And uh, uh, they, of course, officially have to deny uh, that they are provoking male anger, right? That, that's the official line. No, 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 it's not, we are, we're not doing that, right? No, 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 no. Hmm? Uh, they don't say anything uh, about, let's say, the more, uh, yeah, the depressing <laughs> uh, moods. You don't hear uh, much about that, except that they develop apps to turn off uh, the, the phone. Huh? And uh, so th this is the, the, the only uh, answer uh, they have. If you feel bad, switch off your phone. And this is basically their, uh, their only, uh, the only answer uh, they, they have, right? And they don't, by the way, say that to the angry men, right? Okay. So, um, but yeah, you, you are right. Uh, you know, this re requires maybe uh, you know, much larger interdisciplinary uh, approach uh, of uh, of the online uh, personality hmm? uh, that uh, you know has uh, many many uh, different modes of uh, or a mental states. So, yeah, I would I would love to see such, such a thing uh, happening. I don't know if uh, it is a question, but I would like to know what uh, you think about uh, this uh, thought uh, I had uh, during your talk. Um, do you think we can uh, talk us about uh, social sadness? So something mm -hmm. that could uh, he shared between uh, every single user, every single internet user, who can talk only about the uh, individual one because we are alone in our uh, mm -hmm. studio, in our home, in our house, and we yeah. are using the uh, social media or the social tools. Mm -hmm. And uh, sorry, I have to apologize after your response, I have to yeah. just. <laughs> Want to apologize and, no, no. and stay back. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, there's not much uh, known about this, but uh, I have found a few uh, references. 
uh, of uh, particularly feminist scholars who believe that um, collective sadness not only is it possible and that it exists, but also uh, that it can be politicized. Hmm? Uh, that I, I found very, very interesting. Uh, maybe it's, um, it's a form of, uh, let's say, collective mourning, maybe, something like that. Um, for instance, about the loss and there we come, of course, very close to, for instance, the loss of uh, rich uh, social life, but also the loss in biological terms of uh, species, of uh, uh, environmental degradation or uh, uh, loneliness in the sense of, uh, you know, uh, no longer having a, a meaningful social life. So, uh, so that loss the mourning of the loss, uh, uh, we see, so if you rephrase it a little bit in the new, let's say, um, literature about, uh, especially about extinction, extinction of uh, humankind, but also of uh, biological diversity and uh, uh, life in general, uh, there we see uh, that your question uh, is is uh, put on the table, which uh, you know I find uh, very interesting. So yes, I, I think there is there is a possibility uh, of that, but I doubt whether that's going to be it's, it's going to be very likely framed more political in more political terms, and maybe not. Uh, you know, in the subliminal way uh, I have done here, uh, talking about techno sadness as an invention of Silicon Valley uh, to make us feel sad. So um, maybe there is n not much to do about that, except uh, just <laughs> you know abandon the platforms and <laughs> start a much richer, uh, you know, decentralized uh, uh, social life uh, yourself. But that's obvious. Mm. Okay. Any question? May I make a question? So, Greta, thank you very much for your thought provoking presentation. And um, considering, uh, I mean, the topic of digital enchantment mm -hmm. that you introduced, and uh, yeah. considering I'm a sociologist, I couldn't uh, avoid to think about. Uh, Max Weber, enchanted in this enchanted world, yeah, and uh, of you know the idea of the iron cage of the modernity, mm -hmm. and uh, what we may define as the contemporary data cage made out uh, by the platform yeah. that are monitoring the uh, of our behaviors in general and our consumption practices and so on and so forth. But I mean, basically, my point is. Which is the main difference, according to you, about uh, considering the, the iron cage and eventually the data cage? It's just the emergence of an eventual third space, the hybrid digital space, or there is even something more? Because <laughs> some seeds of uh, the sadness were already there in modernity. Mm. Yeah, so. It, it, yeah, with that you, you, you basically mean uh, being modern means being being sad, uh, maybe about the, also the loss, uh, the loss of uh, community, Correct. the loss of uh, meaningful uh, social life, um, the loss of, uh, you know, a, a, a confined world, which, uh, as I said in the beginning, which uh, you know, we uh, time and again experience as a as a cage or as a prison uh, from which we have uh, uh, liberated ourselves uh, for, for a price, <laughs> and we pay the price of our own uh, liberation. Right? And um, yeah, I, I, th I think that's that's uh, that's definitely the case, but. Um, 
the, the problem is that, uh, especially in the, in the current uh, configuration of humankind, there is this technological overdetermination of that issue. <laughs> and so uh, we may define it, uh, uh, you know, in the classic uh, Weberian terms, uh, but uh, there are invisible others <laughs> that, that we cannot really uh, define because we don't know these engineers. Who are they? Who, who are these designers? Who are these people that play with us? Who are these algorithms? Or, yeah, we don't even, they don't have, even have a name. We, it's very, we have a very vague feeling of, uh, of their presence, but uh, yeah, we don't really know. And also they, uh, they love to stay in the background, right? As I said, uh, you know, the, the, the distinction is very clear between overt forms of ideological, uh, let's say, indoctrination, propaganda, fake news, etc., huh? and this uh, rather uh, vague realm uh, of, uh, of feelings, emotions, and um, things that are, in my understanding, uh, easier to manipulate and um, are things that probably go deeper, even though on the superficial level, of course, ideological, um, uh, let's say, uh, influencing, uh, you know, may have political, uh, you know, uh, political profits uh, to be made by by elites or, or movements or, um, uh, or by, um, you know, uh, whatever uh, interests uh, that uh, want to uh, create them and, and want to, um, uh, you know, man manipulate us. Uh, so, yeah, there is, there is an interesting, uh, again, uh, thing we could investigate, how opinion relates to affect. Right, and I, I feel that the people who study opinion eh, at the moment they are uh, uh, quite far uh, away from those who uh, have an insight in the online um, uh, affect uh, economy. Thank you, much appreciated. Okay, any other question? Someone wish to jump? Um, it's, no, it's not enough. Okay. Yeah, I think the core is not enough. And maybe also you should come in favor of the camera. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. I have a very general question. I hope it is clear. Uh, is there a relation between uh, what you label as techno sadness and uh, addiction? Because, yeah, because, and if yes, uh, what is in your opinion the causal relation? I mean, we are techno sad and we need. Uh, addiction to cope with this sadness or we yes. are sad because uh, we are addicted or maybe it's like a vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. So the more we get techno set in these smaller uh, cycles, in this more, so we need to be addicted, but the more we are addicted, the more we are sad and yeah. uh, so on. Mm -hmm. You oh, of did I understand you correctly? Thank yeah, you. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, up to neuroscience to, uh, you know, figure out more. Uh, and I would love to uh, have more neuroscientists uh, involved in this. And I understand neuroscience uh, is the is the source of the of the problem, <laughs> uh, but it also should uh, at least contribute uh, to uh, a possible, uh, you know, uh, resolution or uh, solution way out. Um, because uh, uh, the question that you ask uh, yeah, is a medical one, at least this is my reading. Uh, I, I, have, I do not have a metaphorical or social um, definition of addiction. Uh, I would like to stick to addiction. Um, as a as a medical uh, and of, and then uh, some people say okay but there, there are mild forms of addiction and there are several you know there are uh, heavy ones uh, 
uh, even up to the point, uh, you know, where an addiction to opium or heroin, uh, you know, can can possibly cause, uh, you know, death, right? Or, or um, uh, let's say, alcohol addiction, uh, you know, that leads to uh, a premature death and so on, so on, or smoking for that matter, right? There are uh, forms of addiction uh, that uh, are potentially deadly. Um, but also other forms, of course, you know, interesting uh, 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 comparison often made. Um, and this, there's a lot of, um, uh, funny enough, a lot of literature about this. And that's the question, is social media addiction a variant of game addiction? And game addiction uh, is uh, is more well known and, and better uh, research, right? Of course, you know, billions of people play games, right? And so, um, so there's quite a lot uh, known about uh, game addiction. And so, um, if there is something like a heavy form of social media addiction, that would come in the category of game addiction. Um, then um, my uh, position on this in terms of sadness or subliminal um, influencing of mental states uh, through likes, links, uh, retweets, uh, followers and so on, so on, right? The whole media social media industry. Uh, there, I make very clear uh, the statement that these are, these are not uh, medical. So, uh, and that it's quite uh, dangerous to say that, uh, you know, uh, it's around 3.4 billion people in the world use social media at the moment, 3.4. So it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a good half of the world population, right? Now, is a good half of the world population addicted? Or should we look at them as uh, patients that hmm, should be treated? Is that, is this, uh, is this, uh, you know, uh, I don't think this is uh, useful. Hmm? Uh, to, to look at it uh, from, from that perspective, right? Of course, there are the, the extreme forms. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, as I said, they are uh, studied and treated in the realm of game addiction. Yeah? Otherwise, I don't think that the medicalization of this topic will be our way out. I, I don't think so. And um, uh, maybe you have heard about it. Maybe we can go to the browser. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And if you uh, if you go to the browser, uh, then uh, you can look up a website. Maybe you can type. Yes. We are not sick. Dot com. Uh, and this is uh, the band uh, I uh, I'm part of. And um, yeah, we are not sick. And uh, th there you can uh, find my music album, uh, which I, I made. Um, and there you can uh, listen to the songs that I made uh, precisely about this, uh, this issue. So the question is, uh, uh, we are, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, here you it is. You want to play music? Uh, <laughs> play music, yeah, it's possible. <laughs> or is a song? Or yeah, there are, the, of course, <coughs> there, are the, the, there are the songs. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we're listening to one of, to, to one of the songs here. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, it's interesting because yeah. So this topic, uh, you know, whether we are sick or not, eh, is uh, is for me is a very central uh, question. Very, and it would it probably uh, we need to address it. I would like to hear multiple answers. Uh, because uh, I, th I think this is uh, th it's very very important to be explicit about the medicalization uh, of this uh, of this field and also of uh, me you know media and communication studies for that matter you know do we have to become therapists or uh, you know I mean it's a, it's a, it's a very serious uh, question we need to ask uh, ourselves. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Lisa. Because I do think that what you describe as sadness is different from the oncology of the 19th century. Um, I would like to put, I mean, I had this idea from listening to you that it might be understood in, uh, if you want, uh, phenomenological terms, mm -hmm. as uh, re the recognition, a kind of meta uh, feeling, a kind of uh, meta emotion, as the recognition that. Um, We can perceive something, but as time to uh, be exposed to that something is very short, we can't really uh, reach the meaning of it. So, in that sense, uh, phenomenological. Um, we perceive it, but um, it, it makes us sad because we don't have the time to give it a meaning. Mm -hmm. Would you share this? And the second thing. Um, uh, I was interested in the question by Louisa uh, myself, because why do you think it's so difficult to create solidarities online? You wrote mm -hmm. uh, with, um, mm -hmm. with the Netherlands affair about uh, the donor of organized mm -hmm. uh, Can we say that our difficulty in um, being uh, in creating solidarity online is due only to the uh, form of the social networks or they are just amplified versus something else? So two questions. Yeah, yeah the first one is, uh, is, this, is the central one. Um, I myself um, am very, very influenced uh, early on by the work of um, uh, the philosopher of speed, uh, the French uh, urbanist uh, Paul Verilio, and um, he writes about uh, the, the cultural consequences of uh, the acceleration up to, of course, the, um, the regime of, uh, of real time. I would also like to emphasize, by the way, that one of my American colleagues, who I uh, admire a lot, his name is Douglas uh, Rushkoff, and he did his PhD in Utrecht in the Netherlands. Uh, and um, this is uh, uh, called uh, Time Shock. And he, he The, the team crashed, so I, 
okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, um, so some people say, well, what what if we design new social media or communication systems uh, in which we prolong time, right? Not, uh, and this is a. For instance, there's a group, uh, they published, uh, for instance, the Slow Media Manifesto. Uh, and there's many, many people who, who are working in this, uh, in this direction. Because one possible way is to say, okay, just switch it off. Uh, and this is the, the cheap uh, kind of Silicon uh, Valley option. If you don't like it and if it's too much for you, if it goes too fast, just you know, put your phone aside, just put, yeah. But obviously for me, that's not an answer. Huh? So the answer is, is not uh, the, in the same way as the answer to addiction is not uh, detox. Huh? You know, that's not, uh, that's not the answer. Um, so we need to come to another uh, de design of syst meaningful systems, hmm? which create uh, uh, an, an option of a deep, deep reflection in, in, uh, in time. Yeah. And yeah, and solidarity. There, I would also say that solidarity is something that uh, you know can and has to be designed because at the moment. Uh, the only way uh, uh, of solidarity, uh, for instance, that that people really understand as generous form, is the like button. I like I like it what you do, right? But for me, liking uh, in that sense is not a form of solidarity, right? Uh, a lot of people like the war in Ukraine, believe it or not. I see it every day and I, every day I am uh, surprised why if people want to support the people uh, in Ukraine, they push the like button. Uh, I do not like that you suffer in Ukraine, okay? I don't, hmm? but there are no other ways for us uh, to to express this, right? So the the our vocabulary is incredibly poor, especially when we're talking about you know uh, the language of billions of people. Again, I want to express here we're not talking here about millions, okay? Uh, that's in the past. We're really talking about systems used, literally used by billions of people, right? And what do we give the online billions? A very, very poor one dimensional uh, way. And the question of solidarity, for instance, is one hmm, which is uh, rich, which is uh, full of uh, emotion and, and connection. And uh, yeah, uh, we should design, design solidarity. Now, obviously, we know a bit more about, for instance, how to design, let's say, collaboration and cooperation and other forms yeah, of, of committed social interaction. Now, we, we know that there's quite a lot known, in fact, already 30, almost 40 years uh, on work in work, work groups and work group software, uh, you know, is well studied, we know a lot how people can better work together online. There's a lot of tools. Most of them, by the way, are forgotten. People don't know that they exist uh, anymore. And so it's also uh, a, 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 a world that, that has kind of faded away because of the, in the platform economy, there was no space for collaboration, really. You know, that, that, that's, collaboration is too slow, right? I mean, it, yeah. Uh, it, it's elaborate, it, it's, it's messy, uh, yeah. and so uh, there's not much known, known about that in the same way as I said, uh, you know, decision-making, let even say voting, 
voting, you know, don't go there, don't even go there. It's, yeah, that's a trauma for, for software people, right? They don't want to deal with it anymore. Huh? Yeah, so it means that a, a very important tool for collective decision making has completely been written off because we don't know how to deal anymore with something simple like that, right? Yeah, because it can so easily be manipulated and so on. So, on. well, I'm not going into that, but yeah. Uh, so, all I'm saying here, uh, you know, there's a world to win, especially uh, uh, when I look at Italy, when I look at Europe, you know, I see a world of possibilities hmm, for us uh, to engage and to re. Uh, start uh, social design in the digital age because you know this is a probably our task. Americans are not going to do that for us. Please, please don't wait for the American software. That is over. Yeah, we, we, there's not much uh, coming anymore from there. It's really up to us uh, to start doing that uh, fundamental work, and uh, it's going to be done uh, very, very likely here. Uh, you know, don't look, uh, don't look outside. Uh, that's not necessary. You're in a very um, fortunate position here. Sorry, may I take an advantage for another question? Because uh, thank you very much, Lisa. I mean, for your question, and uh, also you, Gert, putting uh, Douglas Rashkov and uh, President Shock, which is one of. Yeah, my favorite book at the moment, and of course also Paul Bellino and uh, like uh, I was just thinking and um, just please forgive me for the very pop example, but uh, uh, okay for sure the problem is we are stuck on the platform. But another aspect of being stuck on the platform is dependent to the meta. I mean this pursuit of speed in every instant of life. Like think about fashion, fast fashion, think about food, fast food, and mm -hmm. the idea of streamlining efficiency in each and every context. Even of course, I mean, the COVID the situation, the COVID pandemic and the lack of rush for the vaccine. I mean, as long as we live on the <laughs> fast society, we, we couldn't get out uh, the iron cage, the data cage, and all the programming sadness uh, you are brilliantly talking to us. That's just just an hypothesis, of course. Mm. I would like to wrap up, by the way. Um, but please, if you have questions, uh, and remember, you you can also just come to see me. I'm here. Uh, make use of that. Opportunity, if you like. Yep, go ahead. This one. Right. Yeah, yeah, come. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are two, two more questions. Thank you. Okay, so thank you a lot for your contribution. And I was wondering about sadness. So linked to sadness as a program, sadness as an actual real phenomenon, as you are illustrating. What might be the impact of awareness within the development of sadness? What I mean is, for example, from an educational point of view, from the uh, education point of view, considering the young users which are really into these dynamics, um, a kind of awareness and educational program addressed to the understanding of the dynamics nurturing this phenomenon um, do you think they could concretely have an impact on is the condition or there is also another crucial step to do? And it's not just about awareness or just knowing the dynamics of the platforms. Thank you. There I have to be very honest that uh, the last two years of COVID, uh, they haven't really rendered my work uh, completely uh, you know, irrelevant, but the situation got much, much worse. And so uh, today, 
the, this kind of flat and um, uh, quickly fading form of sadness in young people has turned into much more heavy medical forms of depression. And there's a lot um, getting known now after two years about the mental state of young people. And it's, and it's very bad. It's very, very bad. Uh, you probably here in the room, you're too old. <laughs> and so uh, you're, <laughs> um, babe, yeah, but uh, I'm really talking about uh, uh, kids uh, between 15 and 20 uh, years uh, of age. Um, so uh, we're really talking about uh, a whole new generation uh, Z, uh, which, uh, you know, um, has uh, had the, the full impact uh, of the of the social media uh, from a very early age on. And so um, there the question again uh, is maybe less one of addiction, right? Even though, okay, there's dyslexia and very widespread ADHD and uh, all these things. Uh, but um, this, we need to maybe develop also a new vocabulary there, because maybe this form of depression again is less medical and more social and more related to society, and not so much perceived as an individual. Uh, illness, yeah, or, um, and again, there, uh, you know, I would like to point you to the work of Franco Berardi, uh, uh, where, this, where the, he this discusses this, this question of, uh, you know, the social unconscious, uh, and so no longer the, the individual um, uh, you know, case that can be cured or healed with care, right? So these are medical uh, terminologies uh, coming from maybe the previous uh, age of uh, psychoanalysis and uh, uh, psychology, uh, but very likely, uh, you know, we will we will see the birth of a new psychology in the, of the 21st century, no doubt. Yeah, thank you. I have um, <clears throat> a very simple question uh, for both for your presentation, or very formal presentation. I wanted to ask um, just how important memes are uh, to your uh, diagnosis, mm -hmm. analysis, mm -hmm. uh, diagnosis. Um, also, I once joined a telegram group mm -hmm. that existed only for sharing memes, mm -hmm. and they kind of embraced this uh, sadness aspect. You yeah. Obviously. Um, oh, good. Yeah. Uh, Try to catch it also in talk. So weirdly or understandably, also trying to create a kind of sense of community, mm -hmm. much like the anonymous alcoholics here this mm -hmm. um, But this is also, of course, a kind of niche internet culture. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Um, at least I don't see so much memes on Facebook where there must be um, yeah. ads. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. I just just uh, uh, mm -hmm. I'm interested. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Uh, I see the uh, the healing aspect of uh, of the memes. In the, definitely, uh, in terms of uh, the possibility uh, of um, creating a temporary distance to the world uh, that the meme is doing, because the meme is always reflecting a little bit, always in a different uh, world, a different uh, yeah. I, I'm not going to play my uh, meme collection here. <laughs> I would love that. Uh, that would be another uh, another lecture. Uh, and but I can only uh, reaffirm what you're saying. Definitely, uh, we uh, at the Institute of Network Cultures look uh, at um, 
let's say, the subversive or healing aspect uh, of, uh, of mean culture in the sense of um, uh, collective uh, language of uh, satire that uh, creates a form of distance to cope with the world. Mm? And uh, you maybe experience it uh, as uh, uh, something that is, uh, you know, marginal. Uh, however, uh, you know, statistics and uh, everything that we find out about means, uh, in fact, proves, uh, uh, you know, the opposite. That uh, memes are very widespread. Huh? Uh, used by uh, and uh, consumed by uh, so many young, uh, primarily young people. Uh, so um, it is by no means uh, a me, a niche. It's only here in the university context that we experience it as a, a niche. But you know that's uh, to our detrimental. Uh, that's that, that's more uh, an issue. Uh, I would also say an issue in terms of uh, uh, yeah, lack of interdisciplinarity, uh, lack of uh, understanding uh, of this new visual culture uh, in the making. But uh, yeah, thanks a lot for, for your question. Uh, for us, these things are uh, directly uh, related. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Analisa. One more. One more question. Just a few questions. Since I read more about the zero components, which I find really very interesting, rich and playful. And I was impressed uh, by the topic of the uh, relationship uh, between uh, internet and uh, democratization of society. So I want to mm -hmm. uh, just uh, ask him like, how this um, uh, relationship developed over the past few years. Mm -hmm. Sorry, sure. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the problems, the biggest challenge for sociology for me today is, uh, you know, to see internet as society. There is no distinction anymore. Uh, it's not a medium. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so this is, and, but this this requires, uh, you know, a, 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 a very very big upgrade. Mm -hmm to, to uh, the world uh, of, of today uh, in which we maybe even have to uh, ditch you know the whole idea of, uh, of communication uh, as such um, uh, and so uh, the, the problem is uh, what happens when uh, you know the social of social media becomes uh, society <laughs> and I know this is a shocking uh, this is a shocking, uh, you know, understanding because that's that's not a, at all uh, how we want it to be because we have a, a much more uh, general, romantic, uh, overall, almost metaphysical idea of, of society in all its complexity, right? Uh, and uh, why would, would that just only be this stupid uh, device of a phone or something, right? Uh, and maybe it's even uh, techno redu uh, reductionism um, to even state that the phone can be uh, uh, the uh, the essence of uh, of society, right? Because we we really want the society to be so much more, right? That's but in a way this is already becoming an ideological and idealistic statement. You know, we want society to be rich and uh, diverse and uh, complex. And uh, you know, the, the matter of fact is, uh, you know, people don't experience it uh, as such anymore. And um, in many, many cases, the, the, the value systems 
that, uh, that they find uh, online are, are probably even much, much more uh, important now than, than the church can ever, uh, you know, uh, provide us with, or, uh, or, the, or the village uh, for that matter, or all the other, uh, even 20th century uh, version. Think of uh, the political party, the trade union, uh, the so or here in Bologna, think of, uh, you know, the entity of the social movement and how uh, 20, 30 years ago, the social movement uh, provided people with, uh, with meaning, including myself, of course, uh, you know, that's no longer the case. So, um, so th these systems are becoming uh, general uh, providers of, of meaning, of, of social meaning whether we like it or not, right? I mean, this is also something we can be, I'm not, it's not like, you know, I'm not, not here anymore, sitting here to promote the internet or something like that, right? So this is not, uh, right? But at least I want to promote an understanding of it, a, a critical understanding uh, of it, uh, uh, and please uh, a recognition that it's very, very uh, stupid and politically dangerous to underestimate its importance. I could not. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you, here, uh, to recall that uh, you can send me the beginning. So with you, colleagues or students, also students, don't be shy. And uh, thank you also to Peter Lewis Posty and, mm -hmm. um, and also to the uh, Knowledge Information Center uh, for having allowed this meeting. Mm -hmm. And hope to see you tomorrow at the yep. yeah. Six o'clock. <laughs> and it will be quite different then. Uh, poets, music, DJs, uh, so it's very different. Uh. Goodbye.